Uh, and it's my honor to our two keynote speakers for the conference. Robert McIntosh, MS, is a retired U.S. National Park Service uh, senior administrator who received the Services Distinguished Service Award. He now serves on the board of the Mongol Ecology Center in Ulaanbaatar. Clyde Golden, PhD, is Curator Emeritus of the Academy of Natural Sciences at Drexel University, and since 1996, director of the Academy's Institute of Mongolian Biodiversity and Ecological Studies. He conducted the, his Mongolia research under grants from the National Science Foundation for over 20 years. It is my honor to present them for an interesting presentation on the uh, critical importance of science and the rule of law in protecting the integrity of Mongolia's Lake Hovskol National Park. Gentlemen. Thank you. Can you hear in the back? Is every sound good? Thank you. It's uh, Dr. Golden and my pleasure to have the honor to uh, be the keynote at this conference. Uh, we submitted our abstract and then got shocked by asking to do the keynote. So we're uh, uh, a little above our pay grade, but uh, thank you anyways. Uh, we obviously want to talk about um, the integration of science and public administration, uh, science-based decision-making in national parks in Mongolia, and for that matter, the need that exists for that uh, throughout the world. So our talk today is focused on Lake Husko, but in your own experiences with different parks in different parts of Mc uh, Mongolia and different parts of the world, uh, the same lessons uh, are true. I want to start first by just giving us a great geographical reference as to where we are in the world. Uh, Lake Husko National Park is the headwaters of the Selenge, one of the many headwaters of the Selenge in north central Mongolia, uh, down to Lake Baikal, and it flows into the Yenisei River, which is one of the great Arctic rivers uh, in uh, Siberia. Uh, equally important, just to the west, is the Darhard Valley and the Shishkid River, which also flows north uh, into the Yenisei and onto the Arctic. Lake Hosko National Park and the Lake Baikal region is the southern extent of the permanent permafrost, which is very important in the uh, issues of climate change as we move forward. And you can see from the different colorations in this slide, the red arrow pointing to Lake Husko, that to the north is the Siberian taiga, and to the south is the uh, steppe, the uh, Central Asian steppe. So it's the, the blending or the transition from one major ecosystem uh, to another. In local cultural um, traditions, particularly in the Lake uh, Husko, Huskal area uh, is that Lake Huskal itself is the mother sea, uh, Mount Sardeg Mountain to the north along the Russian border, uh, looking over the frozen lake in the village of Hank uh, is the father, and all life uh, emanated from um, the father and the uh, great mother sea. So now uh, the rangers of uh, Lake Husko want to kind of take you on a quick uh, tour of the park. Uh, this is the entrance sign, the new entrance sign, which was donated uh, in 2015 uh, by Yolisto, uh, Yosemite National Park in the United States. At the time, we signed uh, a sister park agreement between Lake Hosco and Yosemite. You can see here in the geographic reference of the country, Lake Hosco is that north central, and the colors just to the left or the west are the uh, three parks that surround the Darkhad Valley. The park itself is uh, 1.2 million hectares. It's about Yellowstone and a half again. Uh, various transitions of ecosystems. 70% of the fresh water in Mongolia sits in that lake. It's 267 meters deep. 68 mammal species are known in the park and 10 fish, one endemic. Uh, the Husqvarna Grangling only, only lives in uh, Lake Husqvarna. Uh, local families, and uh, uh, visitation, which you will see shortly, is uh, skyrocketing, uh, and we'll discuss the impacts of that. 
In 2013, the Mongol Ecology Center worked with the park and uh, developed a vision statement for the management of the park, uh, speaking to the uh, diverse cultural and natural resources that expressed the values of the Mother Sea and the Father Mountain, nomadic traditions and folklore, uh, together for the preservation, fully integrated with sustainable economic development. This is the game changer. In the Soviet period, industrial port, export input from the Soviet Union for 1990 to 2010 or so, things were very quiet, depressed economically in Hatkal. And then in 2014, the paved road from Ulaanbaatar to Hatkal was completed. And this is what has happened to the visitation. You can see early in the 2000s, uh, very little visitation once the road was completed. Uh, 2017, almost 100,000 people uh, visited the park, and a spike in international tourism as well. The border between Russia and Mongolia is now open to Russian and Mongolians, and there's been a huge spike in the Russian traffic from Irkutsk and other parts of uh, <coughs> the Lake Baikal region coming down to visit the Ikoska. The basis of any national park in any country is law, Lake Husqvarna National Park was established in 1992. Think about the timing there in terms of the independence, the uh, 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 constitution, the creation of the parliament, and a very quick decision uh, to preserve uh, Lake Husqvarna area around uh, Lake Husqvarna. It wasn't until 1994, still very quickly, uh, in, the, in the growth of a new nation, that the law on the protected areas was established. For national parks, it set up special zones, sort of like our wilderness areas, set up travel and tourism zones, the temporary structures, and travel was restricted but permissible, and the limited use zones where travel, permanent tourism facilities and families are authorized to live or allowed to live. So moving into park management issues, park zoning. This map was done in 2014. The pink area is the special zone, the sort of wilderness. Tourism is the blue, <coughs> very limited areas that are called tourism, and then very large areas for limited use zone. <coughs> limited use provides no protection for spit fish spawning areas, small natural areas, prime gas grasslands, and the 574 local families that live some or all of the year inside the park, see that number of livestock. In 1996, the Parliament of Mongolia established a national long-term ecological research site to join a group of sites across the world uh, important in understanding the Science presentation global issue. That was 1996. Research started then and has been going, ongoing in this era since. <clears throat> Fortunately, however, in Jingis Valley, which you can see on the map, 2013 unlawful construction of a tourist facility. 2014 limited use zone extended. 36 miles south, that line that goes out. Then the permit for that construction, 18 months later, was approved in uh, uh, December of 2014. No laws were being followed, no uh, standards were being followed in, in that example. And that, unfortunately, is not the only example. Well, Mongolian standards for tourism development in protected areas were developed in 2013, or a new set was established in 2013. 200 meters from the water, set back from the water, one kilometer between facilities. No open toilets, and livestock and tourism facilities must be separated by a minimum of 500 meters. This is a classic example of a local family trying to uh, diversify economically, uh, and it's a challenge, obviously, relative to their standards and what uh, they can do. Here's a livestock pen, an open toilet, and a tourist facility 
all within a stone's throw, throw of each other, which creates public health uh, uh, issues, as, as you can well imagine. In 2014, we did a survey of the deer camps on the south uh, to identify the location of all the camps on the southwest shore. 2016, we came back and did it again, the red of the new camps in a two-year period of time. When you zoom down on this, you can see that the average separation between camps is 0.27 meters. The standard is one kilometer. So again, the standard is not being followed, and the intensity of development is critically uh, impacting or has the, has the long-term potential uh, to critically impact the quality of water in the lake. Visitor experience. I pulled this off the Facebook page for hot tub. Mon local Mongolian wrote that uh, the place was overrun, it was dusty, it was smoky, people can vacation, but do they have to drink so much? They should drive slower, they should take their trash out, stop driving on the grass. Local people, this is what they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Litter, wild camping with no toilets, wild camping, wild trash, no toilets, right on the lake shore. Waste management also creates plastic pollution, bottles, bags, just dumped into various uh, depressions in the landscape. And over time, from sun and wind, they degenerate and end up in the, in the lake, creating hazards for the fish, creating hazards in any water that's consumed through the bioaccumulation of plastic in the system. The Mongol Ecology Center Junior Ranger Program did water quality sampling this last summer. Five test sites, five sites found the water to be clear, found the water to be at the appropriate uh, pH, found the water to uh, be low in uh, nutrients, but found the water to contain super colorful. Uh, the issue is just at the edge of being serious, but it's certainly an alarm bell that needs to be lost. Oil and gas pollution from watercraft, Old boats, two cycle engines, uh, and public safety is a serious concern uh, as far as uh, dealing with uh, folks on the, on the uh, using boats on the water. There are more than 70 private operators, unregulated private operators, doing tour boat type activities on Lake Houston. Park roads. The road on the left is the road from Hotel to Hunt. The road on the right is uh, the improved road on the southwest shore of the lake. Unintended, unintended consequences of this type of construction. They put the road between the gear camps and the lake. Now everybody complains of the noise, the dust, the speed of the vehicles, and the folks from UB and the Toyota the Motor Club uh, have found the lake, and this. Uh, it was scary to watch these six or seven vehicles come speeding down that road without regard to anybody. New roads are in the profile of uh, what's going to happen, happen in northern Husqvarl Ahmed. Uh, this map on the left shows an analysis of the various routes, uh, routes to get from Moron over to the Darhart Valley. Um, the one that is seemingly locally most favored is through the Jiglik Pass. Uh, but that is the one of highest concern. The one down below um, the divide, the yes, is the one that's uh, being, uh, at least as far as this study was concerned, being recommended for consideration. The west side road, 180 kilometers on the, on the uh, excuse me, the east side road, on the right side of the map, uh, presents similar problems in terms of how to develop what will become an interstate international highway not for park use, one, one purpose will be park use, but the road will be consumed by commercial traffic uh, bringing uh, materials north and south uh, from Russia. This is what can happen if the road's not designed properly and if speeds are not controlled and the type of uses uh, are not uh, regulated as well. Managing for new uses, explosion in tour boats on the lake, and within the last two or three years, the appearance of uh, commercially uh, rented uh, off-road vehicles for group tours or for individuals, as well as uh, dirt bikes to take off into the countryside. Way forward, 
adhere to the laws and standards, adhere to the IUCN, International Union of the Conservation of Nature, and the UNESCO Protected Area Guidelines for Best Practices, science-based decision-making, planning with teams of interdisciplinary experts, involving the community and other stakeholders, and most importantly, transparent administrative practices. So now I uh, ask uh, Dr. Golden to uh, review uh, some critical points in water chemistry, the science of water, uh, as far as education is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, actually, every time I hear Bob talk about this, there's something new that's gone wrong. <laughs> that's very tragic. But everything is going beautifully here. Thank you very much for having us. And um, I want to start off just showing you a, a, a picture from our training program that we uh, had between 2002 and 2006. Um, we brought in uh, with support from the World Bank and the Global Environment Facility, 18 young Mongolian researchers, many of whom had master's degrees, all of whom were supposed to speak English, uh, so we didn't have to worry about English at the beginning. They lied a little bit, but they knew enough English to convince me that we'd get along okay. On the other hand, some of the individuals in this photograph uh, our Peace Corps volunteers. We were able to have Peace Corps volunteers to come up during the summer months on their holidays, by the way, um, and train, teach English to all, our, all of our researchers. Now, uh, let me just say, at the beginning we started with about 18, um, two or three dropped out, we added two or three more. Most importantly in all of this is that all of those individuals who completed the program, the five-year program, and we had, by the way, a number of international scientists come in for training uh, in a number of different areas. Um, all of those individuals who finished the program ended up going abroad for graduate study. And of that, 12 of the individuals returned to Mongolia with a doctor's degree. The rest all returned, all of the scientists, young scientists returned. And as many of you know who worked in Mongolia, usually when someone leaves, they don't come back if they can avoid it. And that's not a criticism, one understands that. But all of these individuals, in fact, you may even recognize some of those from your own visitations. Um, there are more than, obviously, 18 individuals in there. There are a number of faculty from the National University, from the Mongolian Academy of Sciences, and international scientists that, again, we were able to bring in for training and specialty purposes. So just a little background very quickly. And the role that I'm trying to play here is to give you a bit of the science our scientific understanding of Lake Hoopsville and why it is so sensitive to the kinds of problems that Bob has just discussed. It is a tectonic basin, similar to Baikal. Baikal, of course, is about 22 million years old. Hoopsville itself is only about 5 million years old and was formed during one of the last tectonic phases that extended the size of Lake Baikal but added. Lake Hoovesville, but it's separate, of course, though they are connected by the Saling River, as Bob said. Uh, the lake is reasonably large. Its surface area is about the size of Lake Erie. Though Lake Erie is around 55 meters deep, Lake Hoovesville and these tectonic basins are much deeper. This is 262 meters deep. Um, and it's the, because of that large volume of water, it's the 16th largest lake in the world. Baikal, of course, is the largest lake. The watershed has been a summer home for nomadic herders uh, for centuries. I mean, you probably can go back 
uh, at least 2,000 years, if not longer, in time, um, where herders have been coming into the valley there, and it happened at the valleys, actually. Um, and, of course, one of the most important things, and most of you familiar with Mongolia know that often they have very serious droughts. So where do you go to get water during a drought? You try to go to a river, you look at the rivers, and they're totally overgrazed uh, in terms of the, of the watershed of the river during a drought. Kuzgal itself can become overgrazed too, but it becomes a, a really important place for the herders to be able to take their animals to get water and generally get good pasture. The herders are coming, in this case, from their winter grazing area, which is up in the mountains, and they come down into the valleys during the summer, and then again in the autumn, we'll start heading back up to the top of the mountains. And that is simply because the valleys during the winter are very, very cold. So it, it, it actually, you can feel it as you walk up yourself. You're four to five degrees warmer as you go up towards the top of the mountain. And you can see also in that picture, by the way, um, they're carrying their gear, um, all of their uh, possessions on the back of yaks here. And then you can see in the background up above the sheep, goats, cashmere goats, and other animals coming down the valley. Uh, most herders will have at least four, possibly five different species of animals that they have in their herds. Um, and in general, what you'll see is that the goats, the cashmere goats, and the sheep are grazing up on slopes. Horses and yaks are down below, down near the, the river. Uh, so they're actually separated ecologically. So even though you have a number of fairly large herds, they really are sort of exploited as, as much of the slope environment as they can. The problems that are uh, Bob has alluded to uh, in terms of construction are really mirrored, of course, in the ecology, the ecological changes that are occurring now. And what we're seeing now is that more and more of the watersheds, as they're being developed for, for these gear camps and the shoreline of the lake, that those areas of the lake that are closest to the shore are starting to have very serious blooms of algae. This is the kind of problem that most people don't think of as a serious problem at first, but as it expands and those areas become more and more polluted, which is really what this is all about, people become less and less interested in going there. You don't want to have to go to a lake and get out and take a shower afterwards so you can clean all the scum, the algae scum, off of you. And yet that's starting to occur more and more. Another aspect of that, in terms of that's a problem of nutrient loading, a lot of it from trash and any erosion coming off of the landscape. And I'll explain what that problem is in a minute. But the other part is that with rapid warming due to climate change, the whole area has already warmed, is warming two to three times faster than we are warming with climate change. We talk mostly here about a one degree warming over the last 40 or 50 years. In Mongolia and in parts of most, much of Siberia, you're really talking about at least a three degree warming. And, and a lot of that is simply because the snow is melting very rapidly. So that rather than light, sunlight being reflected back by, this, by the snow, so the heating is, is sort of reflected back. In fact, now that heat that's coming from the sun is being absorbed by the landscape. And that's why the warming is occurring much more rapidly. And then finally, as I mentioned, the increased trash accumulation. So I'm gonna focus on those three points here uh, very quickly. Uh, Mongolia is generally known to begin with as the blue pearl of Mongolia. Have any of you heard of that before? 
I just wondered because I started there in, in 1994, and that that was the first thing I learned. Um, that Mongolians love pearls to begin with. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly. And so when they say the blue pearl, you can see why. It's really a gorgeous color. The water is so clear. And what happens is that with, as you know, a rainbow is, has all of the spectra of colors, colored light in it. But as light goes down through, that sunlight goes down through the water, different wavelengths, different colors are being absorbed and removed. And the one wavelength of light that goes the deepest is blue light. And then that is reflected back to the sky. And the lake, in other words, as the ocean, is so clear that the light that comes back to you when you look down on the lake is that blue light. Everything else has been filtered out. The reason I mention this, of course, is this is what we want it to look like. This is what you want to see when you get there. But the question is, are you always going to be able to see it? The concept of pollution that we refer to in water, and lakes in particular, such as the Great Lakes, uh, we don't really talk about pollution, though we could. But there is a term, eutrophication, that I think many of you perhaps have occurred have just heard of before. Eutrophication is a phenomenon where a water body is shifting from a low productive, low nutrient system uh, with very clear, clean water to a more polluted water where nutrients are coming in, stimulating algae growth. That algae growth in turn uh, builds up a large plant biomass in the water, so it clouds the water. And then when that bloom dies out, it falls to the bottom into the sediments of the lake. And then that begins to decompose, especially in a lake like Hoosko, we have a lot of oxygen already present in that bottom water. That uh, plant material, dead plant material, is decomposing, 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 and taking up oxygen, drinking oxygen continuously. And so it's grabbing the oxygen out of the water, and slowly these kinds of lakes that are undergoing eutrophication, becoming more productive, what happens is that the mud itself loses its oxygen. The water above it loses oxygen. And when that happened, the nutrients that have been suspended in the water column, and particularly a nutrient like phosphorus that has gone down to the bottom, remained in the sediment under these oxygen, high oxygen conditions. When it loses that oxygen, that phosphorus especially, some nitrogen, but particularly phosphorus, now can emerge from the sediments. And it comes back up into the water and fertilizes the growth of algae. So that what basic basically is happening is that as you're undergoing this gradual increase in productivity, increase of growth of plant material in the water column, it is then regenerating itself, recovering those nutrients, bringing it back up into the water. And so you not only have the influx of nutrients from the watershed, but you ha now have an influx, as it were, from the sediment. So it's a reinforcement effect that builds up very quickly. And this really increases. The lakes that you've seen maybe in uh, here in Virginia or in, in no, we're not in Virginia, sorry, um, in Pennsylvania, where I come from, in Kansas, in Indiana, uh, where I've studied lakes before, you start to get ponds, especially Michigan, or Lake Erie, many of you know. Remember the, the, the description of Lake Erie? Lake Erie is dead. What did they mean by that? What they actually meant, obviously the water was there, the basin was there, it's all there, but you don't find very much life in many areas of the lake. And it's that living material, of course,
course, that has died has released its nutrients. They've gone back up in that uh, reinforcing kind of change that is going on. And that's, but it, it's, it chokes out the oxygen so that many of the organisms present, fishes, etc., are dying. Uh, it's a very serious problem, and that's, that's why Lake Erie was said to be dead. No, it's not. And hopefully it's starting to return to the fact that it's reversing itself again. So, uh, what are the kinds of problems that are causing this? Uh, water quality studies of the tributary streams that we did in 1999 to 2000 uh, found that livestock grazing itself, this is before tourism really built up, livestock grazing itself is fertilizing algae and plant growths, as I just described, mostly in the bays or in the near shore areas. Those are the areas that are being hit first. And of course, those are the areas that tourists want to spend their time in. The increased photosynthesis then increases, and this is an interesting point, but it can end up increasing the, the alkalinity of the water. And when that alkalinity in, in one bay that we measured, uh, if you know the pH scale, uh, neutral is around seven, and you go up to, to 10, you're really in a very alkaline situation where you go down to four or five, you're in a very acid System. We found one area, one bay, with fish pills with a pH of 9.8. Um, I, I won't go into the reason for that, but if anyone wants to know, we can discuss it. Um, one of the, the really key points to understand about Lake Hoobsville is that most of the geology in that area consists of dolomite, sort of a limestone, slight variation on the theme of limestone. But uh, this dolomite is very rich in phosphorus. And again, phosphorus is a major nutrient, if not the major in nutrient, limiting this plant growth in lakes. So the whole effect of the watershed coming in, the nutrients from the watershed coming in, going into the sediment, being regenerated back up into the water is being reinforced overall by half of the watershed of Lake Hoobsville consisting of dolomite that is loaded with phosphorus. Anything that is done in the lake almost without care is going to end up being a problem in Lake Hoobsville. The issue on this, of course, I said, unregulated as, a, as a, uh, a point there. The lake is very sensitive. If it is regulated with the kinds of uh, things that, that Bob was talking about, you don't have to end up with this kind of a problem. If, if those gear camps keep being built the way that they were described, you can imagine what's going to happen going to be very serious in the future. Right now, I happen to be involved with a project from the Asian Development Bank, uh, where the bank is very appropriately investing a great deal of money trying to help the people of Lake Hoobsville develop a tourism industry. And the issue is, of course, is it going, what direction is it going to take? Is it going to take a a regulated direction where everyone follows the best guidelines to protect the lake, or is it going to go in a direction where people ignore those problems as they are doing right now and causing the lake to go in a direction of very serious problems? Uh, as some of you know, Baikal is becoming more and more polluted in many areas. What you see in the watershed now, more and more, are these kinds of algae growths. And that's the kind of thing, most certainly, not only on the bottom, these are benthic algae growing on the bottom, but also up in the water, so the water turns green. Um, then you have the whole aspect of climate change. 
enjoy this problem with nutrients in the lake. We also have a problem with climate change. And I think many of you have been introduced to that enough so that you appreciate what I'm referring to here. Uh, we've been doing interviews with nomadic herders and trying to get their perception, understand their perception of how climate change is affecting their lives. Uh, and these are some of the questions and the responses, just to give you an idea of how the herders. And let me say one thing. Some people, in, when, you, when you're a new Lombardo, seem to suggest, oh, those herders, they don't know what they're doing. They're just going around out there somewhere. Um, not really protecting their environment. In fact, it, in my mind, it's quite the opposite. They're very concerned, and they're extremely good concerned. So what is the biggest environmental impact on the lives of the herder as they responded to us? The first issue is changing weather. It's not saying weather, but which we all complain about the weather. They're complaining about the weather changing. Actually, over the last few days, we have had a lot of um, Overgrazing is much less a serious problem for herders as is the changing weather. And then you ask them, are the seasons changing? Trying to break down that whole idea and other aspects of what they mean by changing weather. The timing of the seasons has changed. And this is really important. As you know, for nomadic herders that are moving to the mountaintops during the winter, they start moving in autumn. They have to know when to start moving. And traditionally, they have usually started sometime in late August early September, remember that's pretty far north. So they have a timing for when they move up into the mountains to get away from the cold valleys. They have a timing for when they move back down to the valleys in the spring uh, because they have to always worry about their water sources. So the timing of the seasons has changed and it is creating substantial problems for the herders. The winters are milder, as you would expect. Summers are cooler, but are mixed with very warm days. And in fact, they now say that they are having heat waves in the same way that we have heat waves, and that the heat waves are burning the grass. And finally, and one of the, the thing that I want to emphasize here uh, for the next couple of slides, as they say, the rains have changed. And they will describe to you that rains used to be a light, silky rain that might last for two or three days. Now it's coming in gushes. And you've seen that, I'm sure, yourself around here. So it's not, I'm not telling you anything that you haven't writ witnessed as a change. And I think if you consider all the things that have been occurring with some of these really heavy rains where it washes cars off of Long Island Expressway and there was one big storm that came out of Chicago and came right down to Washington area here, uh, flooded tremendously. These are not historically common events. They may have occurred, occasionally occurred in the past, but they are increasing in frequency. For This is the kind of rain you don't want to stand outside and feel this warm rain coming down on you. That would have been the kind of rain they would expect in the past. Now what they're finding are cold rains coming down, large drops that are coming down very rapidly on top of them. And they become very, very concerned about their children and their children outside. 
some of these rains are so hard that they can kill animals. And I, I'm not exaggerating that. I hope that you appreciate. Just to show you now, this happens to be um, one of the things that the herders say was, again, we used to have these two or three day rains, half day maybe, a uh, couple of days, light rains. Now we're having really intense rains. Overall, there's not a big increase in the amount of rainfall annually. It's just coming delivered now instead of a slow gradual rain. It's coming down in torrents. It's coming down very hard, as I said. And what you see on this graph is that everything above that horizontal line, where on the top there it says otter rain, every rain above that line is an otter rain. And this is a very, very heavy rain. This is from 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. Every year, the number on top of the line represents the length of that rain. So, for example, look at 2010. You have rains that are hotter rains, very hard rains that are lasting 15, 30, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, with 3 millimeters every 5 minutes occurring. Now, that may not sound like very much, but that's a lot of rain coming down. And this is what the herders say as a result of our interviews and discussing it with them. The herders claim the otter rains were very damaging to their pasture, animals, and to their families while watching the herd. They're very concerned about their, their children, especially when they're out. Uh, because often the child will go out without a shirt on. And then you have one of these cold, drenching rains come down. And, of course, hypothermia then becomes a very serious problem, very common. The rain eroded at the road, uh, very intense, dangerous. The gear was flooded. Mattresses were floating. Pasture covered with running water. That's not typical, certainly not historically. In previous year, these are different herders that are telling us this. In previous year, 2011, had extremely intense hard rain killed many animals. Now, how many animals do we kill when we have one of our rains right now? Well, those really heavy rains <laughs> killed a lot of cars, I know that. Some people were, were harmed in the We had extremely hard, windy rain that knocked down many trees. Our fodder, their, their food that they collect for the winter for their animals, our fodder was blown up into the air. We lost half of the fodder. Our gear was damaged been knocked down in 2010. And these gears are pretty pretty well fixed. And yet the, the, the otter rain can knock them down and blow them around. Last year at the end of July, I experienced otter burrow. That's rain, otter rain. It was dangerously intense. And in most cases, these rains are ending up in floods when they get at Hoovesville near the lake itself. If you could, on the upper left there, you could just walk straight out, uh, you would actually see the lake there. It's just beyond it. But what happens is with, with the stream, stream following an otter rain, uh, is coming down towards the lake. It sort of backs up. The lake is acting as a dam for it, so it backs up. And the whole pasture area, uh, it, this is a stream that originally is about 25 feet across, nothing more than that. And you can see two of our researchers saying they're actually looking for insects, not for fish there. So you can you get a perspective on what that river is like. Now look at above that and over to the right. If you look just beyond, I don't know if you can, I don't know if I can point out, if you look up in the upper right corner there, you see dots there. There are four yaks and a couple of horses there that got isolated out on a little knob, uh, not recognizing. And they're sitting there grazing and not recognizing it. The whole valley was flooding. 
but I, I leave that in for scale as you can compare the two researchers versus the yaks and the, and the horses for scale. So otter reigns now all of the herders say, and I haven't put in the, the analysis for that, but all of the herders are saying the otter reins are much more common now. We used to have these light rains, now we're having these very intense rains. It's not always the only rain that occurs, but nevertheless it is there. Um, this is a rainfall right here that is about two inches over a two-day period. We've had some rains more than that. Great. So my concern, Bob's concern, for Lake Coosville, and I think the concern of many people, it's rather substantial and with good reason. Um, our research on Lake Coosville suggests that strict protection guidelines need to be followed as the bay and shoreline areas, the lakes, watershed are developed for tourism, and as the climate continues to change. This is critical in order to avoid serious problems in the future that would very, very likely include blooms of nuisance, aquatic plant growths, fish kills, more flooding, and would quickly discourage tourists from visiting the park and all of the efforts that build tourism that have come to mind. Thank you. so upset that there were national campaigns, just signs on TV and all those different types of media to tell people to care for the landscape and don't live. So that changed the mentality, coupled with in more intense uh, litter patrolling, particularly in the parks. Because I think if people see litter, they litter. If they don't see litter, 
they think twice about throwing the plastic bag or the cigarettes or whatever uh, uh, out the car window or leaving them behind. So I think it's a both the role of the government to respond to that, but most importantly, you have to change the mindset of the population. And the best way to do that is national campaigns to just make people aware of what they're doing to themselves. Yeah, that's the problem not unique to Mozambique. Uh, but again, I think uh, even with plastic in in retail and so on, if people are educated, they will strive to take care of it as opposed to just litter. And there are campaigns in Europe and campaigns starting in the United States to just try to eliminate as much plastic from the retail stream as possible, and that's a long road to follow, but it, hopefully it'll be successful in those places that are trying it. It can be tried in the world. Now, it may sound, by the way, <coughs> we're only worried about like kids, uh, but I think Bob said it, it reinforced the whole issue, that what is happening there is happening in many of the places. One of the things that really attracted me to Mongolia to begin with is that they have established a plan for protecting 15 percent, if not more, in fact almost 25 percent at one time, of their area in national parks. That goal at least has reached the 15 percent part now. And in any one of these parks, some of them much more protected than others because they haven't attracted people as much as but as they, as they do, there is an ethic that has to be recognized and established for what happens when you go into a park. Our National Park Service has done a great deal and continues to do a great deal. And in Mongolia, they will, I know, catch on and begin to do that too. I'll give you a quick little case study. Three years ago, we started a junior ranger program in Hatgal, and this year we'll have it. It's already started in Hanuk at the northern end of the lake. After the first summer camp, a couple of the kids went to the local store in, in the main strip of Hatgal and sat and stood at the door. And when people left, they challenged them as to what they were going to do with that plastic bag or what they were going to do with that empty Coke bottle and made them promise, basically, that they would um, not just throw it into the countryside. So here we've got a sixth, seventh grader who's already understanding what the issues are and starting to, uh, uh, to try to make a change. And the more that we can do that type of thing and touch one person at a time, the problem goes away. Standard says no open toilets, no outhouses. Uh, making that transition is expensive, and because of the climate, the technology is very challenging. So the ADD project that Clyde mentioned is addressing that. Um, how successful that first phase of that is going to be is still, I think, the jury is out. But the people around Lake Hillsborough who live there, 
you know, ADD recognizes that. We certainly recognize that in our study in 2013. But some of the biggest challenges the park is going to face the transportation issue and waste management. I think we're starting to see that uh, uh, evolve. There are nuggets of, uh, of uh, groups that uh, tourist um, providers in um, Hotkow have created an association um, to address some of these issues. So I think slowly but surely you'll see, and in Hotkow also, slowly but surely see some of these issues being addressed by local citizens and businesses to sustain the economic advantage that they have, because as Clyde pointed out in a couple of his slides, if it's a dump, people aren't going to want that. Very interesting, of course, and a fascinating presentation. You have mentioned some of the tourist camps. Now, why are they there? So there were no tourist camps. They did not exist, clearly. And the last thing, of course, was being done. Now, the tourist camps have uh, overpopulation of them. And then you mentioned they needed to be one kilometer, the regulation is to be one kilometer apart, but yet they exist in 0.27 kilometers instead. So, who is uh, the one issuing permits? Or are they getting permits? This is the local government, is my question, versus the, you know, the local government versus the national government. And then the next question is, Generally speaking, the, the, local, the park, the, the Sum governor, the Ahmed governor, and the minister approve the permit. But there's also sort of a sideway exception that the Sum governor has permission to grant permits to local families for grazing. So, and, and then those you know, families set up for a couple of years uh, for side to principal or secondary. I'm not sure. But because of that, and there's no one point of authority, uh, people are finding ways to drive over it, around it, and under it to, uh, to get. It's going to take uh, a strong recognition of the problem and a new commitment, basically, to start to try to sort this out. There's a new director at Lake Pusco who's been there um, almost two years now. He's serious about addressing this issue, but there are a lot of factors that are forcing him to compromise and try to make things right. At least it's starting, uh, and I can tell you in the history of the United States, in the last let's say, at least 100 years ago, we had very similar types of problems. So it's not like this is I don't, I'm sure it exists. We don't, we don't have it. But I do know that there are more incidences that 
in recent times than they were historically, and if you see some seven or so boat, commercial boat operators that are taking people out of the place, you know, I, I've heard stories that, you know, life jackets are required, that people who are homemade life jackets are You know, if you fall in a lake in Virginia, the water's relatively warm, and you can survive. You fall into the district, the water temperature, even in the warmest day of the year, is not warm enough to allow you to survive. If you're way out of the district, you can't get to the district. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you.